tool assisted speed runs. Making these is known as tassing, and it is often a world of precision. Tassing Classic Doom is no exception. Doom has many quirks to its movement engine, which has led to many tricks, skips, and oddities. Tools can play a big role in finding tricks that can be done by a human, for example, Etum 6's Rocket Glide or Plutonia Map 22's re entry from the void. While some can be done without the need for tools, others are only possible with frame by frame editing. Some are abused and used to whatever extent they can be, and others are only sparsely found and may be only seen once or twice in the IWADs. There are only a few who choose to run the vast landscape of Doom Tassing, and this video is here to change that. You'll be taught how to use X-Ray. X-Ray allows you to have near complete control of the game, from knowing your exact coordinates, distance traveled, momentum, to even knowing the RNG index the game is using. The program can be used to view the inputs of a demo frame by frame, as well as editing existing inputs. Alright, let's download X-Ray and get it running. I've provided a link to the GitHub page of the latest version of X-Ray. Note that if you want to find earlier versions, you need to go to notabug.org, where X-Ray 2 used to be hosted. There's two main ways of loading in IWAD. Leave it as the only IWAD in the directory, or alternatively, you can pass the IWAD argument to X-Ray. To do this, you'll need to create a shortcut and edit its properties. For now, we'll be using Doom 2 as our IWAD. Finally, let's open up X-Ray. You'll be granted a screen with lots of scary numbers, but don't worry, I'll explain all of these as we go on. First, let's load a demo. I'm going to be using Matt's Doom 2 task for this. You can download the demo from DSDA. To look around a demo, use the I and J keys in the input box to move forward a tick and move back a tick. You can use the period key followed by a number to jump forward X amount of ticks. Using a comma instead of a period will allow you to jump backward. On the left hand side you'll see a large list of commands. These are the inputs for every frame in the demo. They are all formatted so that there is an abbreviation followed by a number. Let's break down what Matt's first tick means. MF50, SL49, TR35. First, MF50. MF means move forward, and because there is a value of 50, Doom Guy will move forward with a thrust value of 50. MF50 is the highest forward thrust value possible in vanilla Doom, so if you were to sprint forward, all of your inputs would only be MF50. Of course, the opposite of moving forward is backward, and this is abbreviated with MB for move backward. Next, SL49. SL means strafe left, and the given thrust value is 49. While the maximum strafe value possible in vanilla Doom is 50, it should be noted that being able to perform strafe values of over 40 while turning is considered task only. This is its own little topic, so I won't go too in-depth about it, but it is worth mentioning. Finally, TR35. This just means turn to the right 35 times. Well, kind of. If you open up Doom and record a demo, you'll be using something called short ticks, which just means you have 256 different angles to look at. This becomes noticeable when you start slowly turning and see sudden stop-motion-like turns. Launching Doom normally will result in using long ticks, allowing the player to have more precise turning. Since tasks are demos, we should always be using short ticks. There are a few more abbreviations, so I left them on screen now. We'll dive into how to edit these inputs in just a bit, but first, let's take a look at all the numbers in the main window and see what they mean. Time. It will show the demo time in seconds, but will not round to the nearest minute, so you might see something like 75 seconds. The current tick box obviously shows you the current tick you're on. This can be useful for pointing out exactly which frame something occurs on, and as just a general sense of how long a demo is. The PRNG index box will show you the current PRNG index. Save points are used to prevent performance drops by storing information about the game in a certain frame, which reduces the amount of calculations X-Ray needs to do in the current frame. If you don't use save points, X-Ray becomes very slow, especially on larger, more complex maps. How often save points are made are determined by the three save point modes. Let's go over them. The start mode will place the save point on the second tick of a map. If you're working on a demo with multiple maps and rewind past the save point, it will place the save point on the second tick of the previous map. Why is it the second tick? I don't really know. The user mode will allow the user to place save points manually using the SSP command to create one and the PSS command to delete one. It will place a save point on the tick after the one you're currently on. So if you're on tick 75 and type in SSP, a save point will be created on tick 76. Note that you cannot rewind past save points in the user mode, and you'll need to delete it if you wish to rewind past it. 
The user mode is useful for large, complex maps as you might need to use save points quite often. Finally, the auto mode automatically places a save point every 140 frames, or 4 seconds. It also places a save point on the second tick of every map. With this mode, you can rewind past save points because it will automatically place another one behind it, specifically 70 frames before the one you rewinded past. There's one more thing to go over. If you rewind and are more than 70 frames ahead of the latest save point, a save point will be created 70 frames behind the frame you rewinded past. Alright, that was a lot of information on save points. Let's move on to some of the other values. Player coordinates, distance traveled, and momentum. You'll be using these a lot. They are the fundamental numbers you'll need to always look at. Distance moved, direction moved. You might not use these as much, but they can give you a good idea of where you're headed and how far you're headed. Angle. This can be useful for movement and sometimes tricks. You'll be using this often too. Note that setting this to degrees is the easiest way to use this. Jumping down a bit, the Use a Line box will tell you if you have activated a line via pressing Use. Note that this will show true if you press use while in activation range of a non-switch special line def. Oh, right. Line defs are what make up the shape of a map. Every line def is between two vertices and contains one or two side defs to divide the map into sectors trigger action specials. There are four ways to trigger an action. Which of these applies depends on the line def type number, which also specifies what particular action will occur. A line def is one of these. One of these, and one of these. Now that you've received your PhD in line defs, let's move on. Damage done is the damage done. Moving on to tracking. The thing tracking section contains the following. An input box to add the ID of the thing you wish to track. This ID could be found by going into a map editor like Ultimate Doom Builder. The thing's coordinates. The thing's ticks. If the thing is an enemy, it can help you know when the enemy is going to attack or move. The thing's health. The thing's reaction time. This is similar to its ticks, but it is only used for when the enemy is asleep and wakes up. This is explained well in Decena's video on Monsters AI. The thing's radius. This is misleading, as things are just cubes with infinite height. The radius here just refers to half the length of one of the sides. The thing's threshold. This determines when a demon can change targets. When a monster is idle, it starts at zero, and once it finds a target, its threshold will be set to 100. This threshold decreases with every step that is taken, but as long as the threshold is above zero, the monster won't change targets. An exception is the Archvile, who does not have a threshold and can retaliate against new damage inflictors immediately. To track line defs, put its line def ID in the input box. Again, this information can be found in a map editor. You can track how far Doomguy is from the line and whether or not you've activated it. It will also show you the coordinates of the two endpoints of the line. To track sectors, put the sector ID in the input box. Yet again, this information can be found in a map editor. You can see the floor height, ceiling height, and sector effect ID. For all of these tracking tools, if you wish to track something else but want to keep the first item tracked, just click the Add button and it will add it to the drop down list. You can also clear all of the lists by clicking Clear All Traces under Options. Alright, now that we've gone over everything in the main window, and we know how to move around a demo, I suggest you do a extra immediately and run. I mean, let's learn how to build a demo. First, let's start off by editing existing inputs. Taking a look at Matt's demo, let's make him run backward at the start instead of moving forward to make him look slow. Now, to change the input of the selected tick, you have to type in its abbreviation and hit the spacebar. Okay, easy enough? Well, not quite. Each input has its own special abbreviation for typing it in to increase efficiency. To create a tick that has a value of MB50 or move back 50, we need to type WQ50 and enter it. To change it back to MF50, we type WE50. A way to remember this is by imagining that the W is walk and E and Q is forward and back. To create a tick that has a value of SR50, we need to type SD50 and enter it. To change it back to SL50, we type SA50. Again, we can imagine the S is strafe and the A and D is left and right. This can be a bit easier to remember because you'd press A and D to strafe left and right anyway. For turning values, we use RE for turn left and RT for turn right. 
I like to see the R's rotate and E is left because it is to the left of the R key and T is right because it is to the right of the R key. We can also use the plus and minus keys to quickly change angles by increments of one. For fire used in weapon swap inputs, there is no requirement to press the space bar. Instead, they immediately go into the tick. Their input abbreviations are also the same as their view abbreviations. So F for fire, U for use, and GX for swapping to gun X. All right, let's finally edit the first few of his inputs so he runs backward. We can keep his angle, but let's make sure we use MB50 and SR50 to strafe run backward. Congrats, we should now see something like this. Let's save our precious edit. To do this, click File, Save, or type Save into the input box. Alright, so editing demos can be pretty cool, but now let's get into the big guns. Let's actually make a demo. We're going to make a no monsters task of Doom 2 Map 1. We will be avoiding the wall runs for the sake of simplicity, but we will build the momentum preservation trick at the final door. Before we get into building, we need to edit the demo header. We do this by pressing Tools, then Edit Header. Because Doom 2 is Comp Level 2, we'll change the Comp Level option to 2. If you don't know what a comp level is, it basically just tells the source port how its engine should behave. Comp levels are important for demo recording, as we need the demo to be able to sync if we're played back in the original DOS executables or other ports like Boom and MBF. I'll put a list of the important ones on screen now. Next up, skill. The skill option just means the difficulty setting. We need to change this to be 4, as no monsters demos are recorded on the ultraviolence difficulty. Next, episode and map. We don't need to change this since we're already on Doom 2 Map 1. Note that changing the episode number won't do anything if the WAD is not structured in an episode format like Doom 1. We can jump down to the No Monsters option, which will set to 1. If you hit the Apply button now, you should see the two zombie men at the start disappear. Alright, last thing we need to change. You'll notice that there is a 1 next to Long Ticks, which is not what we want since demos need to be recorded with Short Ticks on. Let's change this to 0. Finally, hit apply once more and we should be good to go. Close the header dialog and let's get into building. To make sure all of our changes were saved, we can double check the header. First, let's run to the hallway. We'll use MF50, SL50, and TR32 for our first tick. Now, instead of creating a bunch of new ticks by pressing N and manually inputting the same inputs over and over, let's hit C to copy the tick. Now, we'll set the turn to 0, as we don't want Doomguy looking completely over to his right. Let's hold down C to copy a bunch of these. You'll notice that in the air, Doomguy's momentum and distance traveled stay constant. This is because there is no friction acting against him. In fact, none of his inputs will matter, because Doomguy has no air control. It is a standard practice to remove these inputs, as it makes the demo look a bit cleaner, and it can be useful to see which inputs actually matter. Let's delete everything back to tick 8, Doomguy's first tick in the air. We can remove the inputs by typing WE0 and SA0. We should now see WT in place of the inputs, meaning there are no inputs. We can create new ticks up until tick 17, where he hits the ground. Let's make sure we're running again, so we need inputs of MF50 and SL50. Okay, obviously we need to change directions. Turning around corners optimally is actually much more difficult than it seems when it comes to Doom, and it is a topic for a whole other video. Instead, let's just switch strafes, which while not optimal, is much simpler. At tick 40, we can switch from MF50 SL50 to MF50 SR50, and we won't bump the wall. To try to get a bit closer to the wall, we can turn to the right during our right strafe. Let's make all of our MF50 SR50 inputs and MF50 SR50 TR1 inputs. If you've done everything correctly, we should have hit the wall in tick 49, at an X position of around minus 16.5 and a Y position of around 1551.6. Obviously, we don't want to hit the wall, so we'll have to tweak our inputs a little bit. Let's change tick 40 to remove the turn, but keep the strafe to the right. Now, I'm going to leave you here to sort out how to build the rest. Feel free to explore, test which frame you should switch strafes, how close you should be to the wall when entering the air, etc. Before I go, I'll leave you with a quick tip. To sustain more momentum after colliding with a wall, you want to fully collide with the wall. Basically, you want to just barely not touch the wall on frame A, and then touch it on frame B. On frame B, you shouldn't move any closer to the wall from where you were on frame A. I'll go a bit further in detail about this in a different video. Now, pause the video and come back once you've reached the exit door. Alright, we've reached the door. Let's talk about how to get a momentum preservation trick. I'll go for a basic approach for simplicity's sake. 
Once we've opened the door, immediately back up to the wall on the left, making sure we have plenty of room in front of us. Now, straight front forward and edit your angles to try to get as close as possible to exposition 976. What we're doing here is getting super close to the left wall, which will allow us to get the momentum preservation trick. It's worth noting to not actually get to x equals 976, as this can cause some problems. As you run forward, be sure your x coordinate stays very close to 976. And by very close, I mean very close. Your coordinate should only be off from 976 by around 0 0.001. In this example demo, you can see my x coordinate is 976.000397. Now, on the tick we collide with the door, let's change our angle to be around 45 and make sure we're using inputs of MF50 SL50. We should see our wide distance traveled go to zero, but our y momentum is still nice and above zero. If you don't, it's possible you're not close enough to the wall on the left, or you are too close to the door in the frame before you collide. It's important to note you need to be around one unit in front of the door while performing the trick. Any closer and you'll run into some problems. In this case, since the door is at wide position 1032, we should strive to be around wide position 1031 or 1030 to be safe. In my example demo, I get to around 1030.7. To keep our momentum up against the door, we need to keep our angle around 45 the entire time. Just keeping it at 45 should be good enough, but you may need to change it to 43 for a few ticks sometimes. Again, this is using inputs of MF50 and SL50, and it should be noted that while it is possible facing other directions, these specific angles only work if you're strafe running left. Now is a good time to talk about the difference between distance traveled and momentum. To put it in a nutshell, momentum is the player's speed after friction is applied, and is used as a base speed of the player on the next frame. Because momentum is calculated after movement takes place, momentum is generally smaller than Doomguy's distance traveled. But it is possible to have a momentum value greater than zero while not moving. How is this possible? Well, the explanation behind it is a little complicated, and I'll leave a link to a technical explanation of it in the description. The key takeaway here is that distance traveled is where the game puts you before slowing you down. Your momentum is what's left once friction acts on you, and it paired with player thrust determines your distance traveled on the next frame. Let's wrap this up. You will notice that once the ceiling of the door is high enough for Doomguy to fit through, if we have high enough momentum, we travel much farther than expected. This is called a wall run, and while I won't go into detail about it here, I will in a different video. Anyway, just keep running until you think you're close enough to the switch. Then, enter a use command and turn until you press it. If you can press it, check if you can on the frame before too. If you can't, try pressing it on the next frame. Believe it or not, there's another little engine quirk I get to explain here. When checking if you're in range for a switch press, the game will actually use your position of the previous frame, but your angle of the current one. I'd figured I'd just leave this here because it's worth noting. Once you've pressed the switch, add a use or fire input during the end screen, add some empty ticks, and boom, you've officially built your first demo using X-Ray. Make sure to save your demo. I hope you found the guide useful. There is much more to uncover when it comes to testing Class of Doom, and I'll be releasing some more informative videos on these topics as time goes on. You may have noticed that we completely left out brute force in this video, but it will be covered soon in a different video. I hope this guide provides enough basic information to dive into the world of building demos. I plan to release more videos on the topic, so stay tuned. Until then, I'll be signing off. I hope to see some new tasters on the block soon.